I was in a masochistic mood last night, and I decided, what the hell, I might as well try and slog through the last three episodes of Marvel's The Kate Bishop Show, starring Marvel's Kate Bishop and her and co-starring her much less talented male sidekick, Clint Barton, also known as Hawkeye. Except, no, actually, he's not also known as Hawkeye anymore, because Marvel's Kate Bishop actually takes his name at the end of the proceedings, having already taken his dignity and his male sex organs. We haven't seen a male character emasculated by female filmmakers quite this gleefully, I, I don't think, since since Luke Skywalker was relegated to dying a lonely old pussy on some abandoned old planet so he could be duly replaced by Rey Skywalker. But as I'm watching Marvel's The Kate Bishop Show, starring Marvel's Kate Bishop, a number of things are, are going through my head, and they don't all involve the intellectual incoherence of radical feminism, though some of them do. One thing that occurred to me was that I was probably taking a look into the future, where where content is manufactured according to polling data and focus group scores and, and what have you. Now, Marvel's The Kate Bishop Show, it feels like it was written not by a couple of female neophyte writers in their 20s, but rather by a computer algorithm. I can almost hear how the boardroom conversation might have gone. Okay, which sectors of our brand consumer community are we going to be targeting this latest show to, this Hawkeye show? And can we change the name because it sounds a bit too masculine and aggressive? Well, yes, sir. As a matter of fact, we were, we were thinking of changing the name to Marvel's The Kate Bishop Show, starring Marvel's Kate Bishop, who has a vagina. Okay, drop the last four words. Otherwise, I like it. Much more feminine and non-threatening. I like feminine and non-threatening. Well, sir, we could really go over the top with the feminine non-threatening thing and, and make the title cards like all mauve and purple and shit with all lowercase letters because, you know, uppercase letters are too aggressive and dominant. Hell, I'm the one in charge around here and I say go big or go home. I want this show to be so girly, it makes sisters look like the A-team. Now, what other demographics are we trying to target with this thing? Well, sir, there's the gays, obviously. Gosh, you think? I, I think you had the gays at the purple and mauve. Don't tell me tell me something I didn't know, goddammit. Well, sir, we've had some fascinating data come in from our focus groups that we think it would be fun if we were the first show to specifically target LARPers. LARPers? What the hell's a LARPer? Is that some kind of new street drug? No, sir, actually, it's an acronym. It stands for Live Action Role Playing. These are grown men and women whose primary mode of recreation is to dress up like fictional characters and, and have pretend fights with each other in the park. You mean there are grown-ass adults who actually do that? And Indeed there are, sir, quite a few, actually. But I'm guessing none of them are attractive women. Uh, that's probably a safe bet, yes, sir. Okay, well, hell, if you guys think there are enough of these people out there to move the needle on our little purple and mauve here, that then let's go for it. Let's LARP this thing within an inch of its damn life. And who's writing this script, anyway? I don't see any writers in here. Well, sir, actually, we just got the word from corporate that they're going to be phasing out human screenwriters with immediate effects. So, so the script for Marvel's The Kate Bishop Show, starring Marvel's Kate Bishop is going to be written by a super-advanced computer algorithm that the Disney Imagineers have been working on for at least a dozen years now. So you mean we can we can churn out the, the same shitty content, but we don't have to pay shitty screenwriters to write it anymore? That's correct, sir. It's very exciting. All the director has to do is download the app onto his tablet or smartphone, go to the home screen, and enter plot parameters, demographic targets, and desired runtime. I'm really liking the sound of this, young man. Well, then what happens? Well, sir, in, in this case, you would direct your attention to the PowerPoint display if you, and under plot parameters. We would enter gender swap one of the Avengers after thoroughly humiliating and marginalizing the, the original male cast member. Then, under demographic targets, we're going to click, and we can click up to five things here, but we're going to select women, girls, ladies, chicks, homosexual men, and LARPers. And lastly, under desired runtime, we're going to pick six-part Disney Plus streaming series. And that's it. We're done. Oh, right, that sounds good. How long will it take the algorithm to produce a shooting script? Well, for something like this, maybe 45 seconds, and you're good to go. We'll never need a screenwriter 
ever again. We have successfully automated the Marvel content creation process. From here forward, it is a humming, thriving assembly line of sweet, sweet content. Targeted with pinpoint precision toward any dumbass loser pervert whose wallet we feel like emptying. So what do you think, sir? Are you impressed? I am impressed, son. Very impressed. In fact, I I've never been prouder to be a Hollywood studio executive than I am right now. I am about to cry tears of joy that are colored purple and mauve. <laughs> From high atop the battlements of Castle Curmudgeon, where my purple and mauve jersey is currently at the washerwoman's shack, getting the tears cleaned out of it. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and all ships at sea, welcome to the program. I am your eponymous host and humble servant, and I didn't go into this planning on doing an episode-long review of Marvel's The Kate Bishop Show, starring Marvel's Kate Bishop. But frankly, I think I'm already too far down the rabbit hole to climb my way out of it, so I guess you'll just have to bear with me. If you ask me to sum up the plot of this show in 30 words or less, I might say something like this. Kate Bishop is the bestest ever. Clint Barton helps her be the bestest ever at even more things. Then she kicks him in the balls and steals his name. <laughs> See that? I finished with one word left over. Now, as we know, it's sort of par for the course in the woke Hollywood era that we start out with a perfect female protagonist, void of any defects or character flaws, who is the bestest ever at everything, and who, most importantly of all, don't need no man. And true to form, right on cue, that's where we start out. With Marvel's The Kate Bishop Show, starring Marvel's Kate Bishop. She is fun, smart, pretty, quippy, self-assured... And of course, she can dispatch a room full of 220-pound professional assassins in under 90 seconds with no martial arts training. But other than that, she is a real misfit who, who, who is really in need of guidance from a mentor. And that's true. I'm not lying. Because remember, Marvel's Kate Bishop don't need no man for nothing. So we can't show her assimilating any skills or wisdom from the male Avenger whom she claims to admire as a role model. His function in the story is going to be older male mentor whose services aren't actually needed, whose narrative function is to always be surprised and impressed by whatever the female lead character happens to do. The other two types of male role in, in this production are you've got comic buffoon henchman who exists to get his ass kicked by Marvel's Kate Bishop, and you've got Kate Bishop's stepdad who's also a comic buffoon, but we're supposed to think he's a villain. Except he winds up being a good guy in the end. You got that? For the writers on this show, that, that's probably what passes for subverting expectations, for, for circumventing standard narrative tropes. It probably went something like, hey, you know how the fathers in these things are always either absent or evil? Yeah. Well, how about if we make this dad secretly be not evil? Oh, <gasps> you sly little minx. You subverter of audience expectations, you... Oh, and by the way, this show was nice enough to confirm Curmudgeon's second theory of woke cinema, which says there must always be a man versus woman fist fight within the first five minutes. I think by the time we're halfway through the first episode of this thing, Marvel's Kate Bishop has head scissored every criminal thug in the New York City metro area right into submission. Now, ordinarily, I would be telling you more about the plot, but. Honest to God, I just watched half the episodes of this thing less than 12 hours ago, and I have no idea what the story was. At first, it was something to do with Marvel's Kate Bishop somehow through a series of comic misadventures wind up, winds up dressed in Clint Barton's clothes while she's single-handedly dispatching the gang of assassins, and... All right, small discretion. Digression. Sorry, quickly. And I, I don't want to sound like something out of a screenwriting 101 class, but seriously... You can't have a character be the best in the world at everything and also a naive bumbler. Oh, haha, ha, she doesn't know how to work her cell phone. Isn't that funny and cute? No, it's not funny and cute because you just established her character as basically the deadliest, most badass woman in the whole wide world when you had her single-handedly dispatching that gang of assassins like four minutes ago. You can't transition from that to... Ha ha, I'm, I can't work my phone and I'm having awkward banter with mom and dad. Look what a wacky life I lead as Marvel's Kate Bishop. I originally stopped watching this show the first time I tried to watch it at the end of the second episode, when the big reveal was that the, the big bad villain was a deaf female amputee. 
It feels silly to type that sentence. It feels even sillier to say it. But there it is. The first big bad villain in Marvel's The Kate Bishop Show is a deaf female amputee. And if nobody else is going to ask the question, then I will. Can't you just steal her prosthetic leg? Your character has already been established as the world's best archer, who's even better than the male Avenger who tags along with her. Can't you shoot an arrow that makes her fake leg fall off? Because isn't the boss battle pretty much over then? <laughs> I got your leg, bitch. What you gonna do now? <laughs> Are you gonna kick my ass? <laughs> I, granted, I, I guess she would have to say all that in sign language, but this is Marvel's Kate Bishop, so obviously she's fluent in sign language. She, she learned that shit in her spare time back when she was four years old when she wasn't busy dispatching 12-year-old male assassins. So, the show ends at, at the close of the second episode with Marvel's Kate Bishop... She taunts the deaf amputee who's left powerless to do anything but hop after her and ask for her leg back in sign language. And then Marvel's Kate Bishop says, Oh, what's that? Sorry, I can't hear you. I have my head turned. Ha <laughs> ha! Hey, maybe you should get a pirate leg and change your name to Peggy. <laughs> what now? I feel like this show I've just, I've just written right there is better than the actual show I've watched. But I'm telling you right now, Kevin Feige, if I turn, if I turn on season two of Marvel's The Kate Bishop Show next year and I see Peggy the Deaf Pirate come back to claim her revenge, don't think I won't come after you for breach of intellectual property rights. So the first half of this thing is, like I said, I, I'm at a loss to understand what the story was supposed to be, but it was mostly an exercise in Marvel's Kate Bishop being better than every man at everything, and then sitting and talking about it. A lot. A whole lot of sitting and talking, and sitting and talking, and sitting and talking. You totally can't tell at all that this thing was written by two young women, can you? Because they're carrying on the proud tradition in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, where we propel the narrative forward by sitting and talking about things that happened in other movies, or sitting and talking about events that never happened in another movie, but that we would very much like to be watching more than this. Now, here's a pro tip for these writers. It's, a, it's never a good thing when your characters talk about an event and the viewer thinks, yeah, that sounds great. I would rather be watching that than this. I, and, and you never show it to the viewer. You never mention it. And you commence with nine and a half more minutes of people sitting and talking about the thing you're not showing them. And by the time you're through with the episode and there's been this much sitting and talking, one can't help but get the feeling that... Wow, they're really trying to pad this thing out with the sitting and talking, aren't they? In, in order to squeeze six episodes out of it, either that or the effects budget is so tiny that a bunch of sitting and talking is the only recourse they have. But then, you get to the final three episodes, and, and the show it sort of weirdly, awkwardly transitions into being a soft sequel to the Black Widow movie. Because all of a sudden, Florence Pugh shows up as Yelena whatever Ova. Natasha's sister, and, and she's got a bug up her ass because she just came back from being blipped. She knows Tasha's dead, but she doesn't know how she died, and she's got it in her head that Clint is responsible somehow, which is nice, because finally, on the back stretch of the series, this gives Hawkeye a little something to do, in addition to his normal duties of tagging along with Marvel's Kate Bishop and marveling at how perfect she is at everything. And I guess... It's the ultimate damning indictment of this show when I say the appearance of, of Yelena, a supporting character from one of the weaker entries in, in the MCU, a character we just met for the first time about six months ago, her appearance is the best thing about this series. I, I like the actress, I like the character, I even like her over-the-top fake Russian accent. I like her jokes and her quips. I wonder who wrote them, though, because her lines don't sound like they were written by the people who wrote the rest of this show. But anyway, her appearance is not the big twist. The big twist, which is revealed at the end of the fifth episode, is that the real actual big bad villain, the final boss battle, if you will, the guy Peggy the Deaf Pirate works for, is none other than the Kingpin, played by Vincent D'Onofrio. In other words, the same version of the character that we last saw in the Netflix Daredevil series. And this is fascinating on a couple of different levels. For starters, this is the second crossover from, from the Netflix Marvel Universe to the MCU, and they both happened just within the past month. Charlie Cox made a brief appearance as Matt Murdock in the new Spider-Man movie, and now we've got Vincent D'Onofrio's Kingpin showing up in Marvel's The Kate Bishop Show, starring Marvel's Kate Bishop. Now, there are 
those who might propose that this is merely an act of fan goodwill on the part of Disney and Marvel, since the Marvel Netflix shows have all gone by the wayside a few years ago now, but they were shows for the most, most part that the fans really liked. Not counting Iron Fist, because that show sucked balls, and Defenders was pretty awful too, but Daredevil was great, Jessica Jones was good, Luke Cage was good, and The Punisher was good. It's probably not overstating things to say the Daredevil show is the Marvel product from the past ten years that the most, that is most well-liked by the broadest cross-section of Marvel fans. So, when a character from that show, especially a, a well-liked character like Vincent D'Onofrio's Kingpin, shows up all of a sudden seemingly out of left field on a god-awful piece of crap show like Marvel's The Kate Bishop Show... Is it a tacit admission from Marvel and Disney that they know people don't like the woke bullcrap they've been churning out since the start of last year? Is this Marvel saying to its fans, Yeah, we know this show is embarrassing and god-awful, but when you look at that, it's Vincent D'Onofrio as the kingpin from the Daredevil show. You remember the Daredevil show? The show that ended sufficiently long ago that we never had a chance to get our woke tendrils into it? Therefore, people still really like it? Therefore, it's probably the last wellspring of public goodwill that we have left remaining at our disposal? Look at the shiny object! Isn't it shiny? You're so excited to see Vincent D'Onofrio's Kingpin, you've forgotten all about how bad the rest of this insufferable purple and mauve starring Marvel's Kate Bishop was, haven't you? A serious... If this show was geared any more toward female fans, they would have to give you a coupon for a free pack of sanitary napkins in exchange for having watched it. And I'm not even sure what to say about the LARPers. The show can't seem to make up its mind how, how it wants to treat them. At times, they are objects of mockery and derision. At other times, they're treated as serious characters, even as valuable collaborators for our two heroes. Marvel's Kate Bishop and the middle-aged man who follows her around everywhere. And about that, at one point, it's Christmas Eve, and Marvel's Kate Bishop, along, along with Clint Barton, soon to be the artist formerly known as Hawkeye, they're... They are dressing each other up in funny sweaters and getting drunk together in her apartment. While his wife and kids are back on the farm wondering why Dad never turned up for Christmas like he promised he would. And I'm watching this thinking, am I supposed to not find this off-putting? That, that this dude's getting drunk with some 20-year-old hottie on Christmas Eve in, instead of being at home with his family like... Just as a general principle, shouldn't a married man in his 40s not be hanging out alone in the apartment of a woman half his age, imbibing alcohol like there's no tomorrow? Is that just me? Have I turned into a Puritan in my old age? And it's weird, because this show is written by women, and it's seemingly written for women and marketed to women. I mean... Of course, unless there is a huge market of straight men who love purple and mauve and talking about their feelings, and I just didn't know about it, but... And I guess that's possible, but why would a couple of young women, young women who presumably deem it their mission in life to smash all vestiges of the, the evil, malevolent patriarchy, why would people like that write a scene like this? Wherein a young woman brings a much older married man into her apartment to get drunk and play dress-up. Is there a psychological undercurrent there that I, that I probably should leave well enough alone? There probably is. So I think I will. I have no idea what's coming out next from Marvel, but I'm, I'm sure it'll suck. Because we're too far into the downward spiral of diminishing returns to expect much else at this point, frankly. I, I still haven't watched Eternals. I've had it on my laptop for a couple weeks. I, I guess I'll just need to wait for my, my next attack of acute Marvel masochism. Although, actually, I, I did see where it's going to start being on Disney Plus on Wednesday, I believe, so... Maybe that's my way in. Maybe if they put it right directly in front of my face and all I have to do is tap, maybe that'll get me over the hump to actually watching that piece of shit. But I refuse to review it, no matter how much mockery it deserves. I'm actually kind of embarrassed that I wound up reviewing Marvel's The Kate Bishop Show, starring Marvel's Kate Bishop. But it's done now. I can't take it back. It lives on, on the interwebs for all all eternity. So if there is some descendant of mine watching this video 500 years from now, no, I don't have a good reason for why I watched and reviewed 
Marvel's The Kate Bishop Show. People just did strange things back in the ancient times. Don't read too much into it. And for those of you watching right here in the good old 21st century, I will see you Wednesday. And I hope you have a pleasant tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Do not comply. Get off my lawn.